residential system or a farm that, that has quite a substantial amount of power needs, then you will have to get something bigger than 10 kW. And it might be a 30, there's the 30s, 25s, 50s, then it jumps to 100, and then it jumps to 600 kilowatts. Uh, those systems have to be grid tied because there's so much power there that there's, you normally wouldn't put them in batteries because it takes so many batteries. Well, yes. what, what's the, uh, how high can you go in terms of kilowatts and, and have it just be battery system and not be grid tied? 10 is, is, 10 is pretty much the cutoff. Is that just because? It just, yeah, it's just because of the, the volume of, of electricity that you're trying to store. It's such a large amount. For example, a, a 10 kilowatt ARE will produce about 1,900 kilowatt hours a month. So 1,900, that's, that's a lot, you know, and a, what's that, 60 a day, roughly? Well, average battery string will only hold about eight. So that means you'd have to have eight strings of batteries to hold that for that, well, that service. Can you just increase the strings? You can increase the strings, yes. Yes, you can. But normally you, you don't want to at $2,500 a string. So that's, that's the limiting factor there. Yeah. And the battery technology is improving. I mean, you could go lithium ion. Those, what I talked about there was, was uh, basically deep cycle lead acid batteries. You can go with lithium ion and some other ones out there too, but in sealed ones and gel cells, and there's a lot of, lot of ones to pick from. But uh, the, right now, the best buy in the market for small wind and residential use is the, the lead acid that you actually have to check the water once a month and see if it's okay. Uh, that's the best performing. And really, you usually don't have to change or add much water typically if you do it that way anyway. Yeah. Is it correct that if you go with a small unit and the batteries, that you cannot use net metering and be tied to the grid? Is that correct? No. No, you can still use net metering. But the trick to that is to make sure that your utility will still let you run if they're not running. And not all utilities will do that. Uh, you can feed the power to your batteries. If you have excess, then it goes down to the grid. The system will do it. It's a matter of just programming the system. That's very easy to do. But you've got to get permission and typically fill out a 50-page form and then pay the utilities X number of dollars before they even talk to you to make sure that they are, will take the power. And then, again, I make the agreement that they will take the power when you have excess and they'll still let you use the power if they're down. A lot of times they, they won't let you use it. That was why we did not go that way with ours. The system was fine. We didn't have to change anything other than the, the settings to sell power to them. But we decided not to do it because they said if, if they go down, we have to turn ours off. I said, if we're making 25, 30 kilowatt hours a day and, and, you, guys, you, know, and you guys are down for a week, why would we want to be shut down? It doesn't make no sense to me. So, uh, you know, I know what they're thinking. They're thinking that, well, you might accidentally feed power on the grid and kill somebody. Well, we don't want to hurt anybody. The system's set up so that it will not feed power to the grid if, if the grid is down. It knows if the grid has power or not. So it's got a fail-safe switch on it, built-in electronics, that it will not send power to the grid if there's a, no power already there. So it, and technically, it should never ever backfeed that way. And what we're told by the actual servicemen themselves is that, uh, you know, in their terminology, that there's no you know, lineman worth his salt if he doesn't ground it to start with himself. He, he basically believes nobody. He believes that the power is on unless he purposely grounds it himself and turns it off himself. Otherwise, he consumes that it's always live. Otherwise, he won't be live. And that's just the way it is, you know. It's kind of a sad fact, but... We're trying to leave room for questions here, so we're kind of getting summary here. The, the site, of course, open is the best, no question there. The degree of openness is, is kind of uh, negotiable, you might say. Uh, you, every time you put another tree up, you lose a certain percent. Every time you get close to a building, you lose a certain percent. Uh, if you're fine with that, then go with it, you know. It doesn't mean you have to have the perfect site. There's literally no perfect sites in the world. Uh, so you're always going to have to make some compensation there. You need to know the, the power requirement, the amount and time when you use that power. Uh, the system 
whether it's wind or solar, whatever it is, uh, you know, it's only going to produce X number of kilowatt hours any given time and for that uh, amount that of wind that it has, for example. Uh, if you design a system that will typically produce 10 kilowatt hours a day, for example, your, your turbine it does, but you need 20, well then automatically you know you're not meeting your needs. Uh, if you produce 10, but normally you need only 5, but there's times when you need 15, well then you've got to decide when those times are. Do you have enough battery storage to handle it? Or are you net metering so that you can buy back from the grid? And, and that kind of thing. All that should be looked at to make sure that you're, you're balancing that out. And there's no magic rule there. It doesn't mean you have to, to uh, match it one for one. It's never going to match one for one. Uh, it's, a tr it's kind of a decision that you have to make as far as uh, do you want to try to handle most of your load. <coughs> most of the time, you try not to have an oversize. If you can get by with a, a 2.5 kW or a 10 kW, you try not to go to the next level because the economics just aren't there. Uh, and uh, speaking of that, if you're typically if you're paying 11 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity now, then you start to have a reasonable payback on your turbine. If you're considerably less than that, chances are the payback isn't there. Uh, and what we say is considerably good is that you're about a 15 to 18 year payback. It's, it's kind of the way it's going for 11 cents typically. We talked about the <coughs> maintenance being fairly minor for wind. Then uh, the warranty usually is, is five years. Uh, be careful how that's written. Again, try to make sure that the blades are included in that because that's the most likely thing to go bad. And if there's a, some defect, manufacturing defect or whatever, it'll show up in the first year or two. And you want to make sure that's covered under the warranty so that you don't have to replace that yourself. Uh, a set of blades for a $10,000 turbine might be $1,200, $1,500 of the cost. So you don't want to have to replace that yourself if you don't have to. Uh, one thing that you should be aware of, the wind typically is better in the winter. Uh, we, for example, uh, keep data hourly, send our data to Iowa State uh, every year, and we see a difference from summer to winter. Obviously, we see a difference from year to year. This last summer, we, we had two of the African turbines. We normally get a couple hundred kilowatt hours a month out of those, not quite so much in the summertime, maybe 150 or so. This last summer, we got 50 per month. 50 per month instead of 150. Our solar produced more as a compensation. We were 650 solar. We normally get about 450. So that shows you the difference in how things work. Usually in a bright sunny day, there's not much wind, for example. On a cloudy day like today, all of a sudden the wind's growing like crazy. And we've even noticed hourly. If the, if the clouds come up, chances are that the sun's gone down and the wind's picked up. So you can watch the meters two meters simultaneously. The wind's going up, the solar's going down. And then when the sun comes back out again, the cloud's gone, then the wind goes down, you got the solar. Uh, we kind of advocate the, the hybrid system really as, as the best overall for consistent power. Uh, that's why we do it for our building. We've got the solar and wind, and for most of the uh, projects we do, we do the combination hybrid, solar and wind, uh, just because of things like that. But if you can't afford both or you want to just do one or the other, uh, wind is a little better payback typically than, than the solar right now. It's, it's uh, again, the 15 to 18 year payback where the solar is more like 18 to 20, 21, something like that year payback. And you do have to be aware though that in the summertime when you get those hot still days, chances are you won't be making anything for wind at all. So just be aware of that. As far as the storage, uh, we usually say that you can get about four kilowatt hours out of a set of batteries at the max. We set ours up for only two, so we're only taking the top two off of the eight. Uh, some people like to take more off, like to dip it to 50%. If you do that, you're shortening the life of your batteries m much more significantly. Uh, good quality batteries, and we didn't show any here, but good quality solar batteries like uh, Charette's, or uh, 
MKs, you know, if you get the best ones of those, you know, they'll, the warranty is for seven years on the Surettes. They usually last 10 to 12 years. Uh, if you get the cheap batteries, you know, they're, they'll last three to four years. And so you'll say, oh, they're performing great the first year. By the second year, they're not performing near as great. And by the third year, you really start to notice a huge decrease in performance. So it pays to, to get the better ones of those. Uh, as far as storage, commercially, you can get up to 40 megawatt systems, which is enough to run the country of Ireland for eight hours, just to give you a range. It's kind of neat to see the range, I think, in, in the industry. You know, when you're talking about residential, you're talking about commercial anyway, it's, it's nice to see the range that's out there. Because the big stuff will eventually come down to the, to the little guy, and the little guy's stuff's going up to the big guys. And so there's a nice trade-off that way. We talked about the payback and, and the rates of the utility at roughly 11 cents. It's kind of the, the break even there. Uh, here we said 12 to 15 years. The last numbers here is not quite so attractive because the labor rates have gone up, so that's why it's a little bit longer payback than, than what we even show here now. And you can literally do custom sizes all the way from you know a small system that will run a tent to something that will run the, the city or or your house, or your farm, or your, your, just your, your hog building, or whatever you want to run, you can do it all. The trick to that is knowing, again, the amount of power you need and when you need to know to have that power, as well as you know, what your budget is. Uh, if it's an unlimited budget, which really never happens, you know, yeah, you can do anything you want. But most people have to, to meet that. And there's two ways to start there. You can start with the budget, say, I want to spend a maximum of $20,000 or something like that. Uh, and then what can I get for that? The other option is to say, this is how much power I need. How much is it going to cost? Uh, average house wind system, for example, is in the neighborhood of 25000 That gives you about 400 kilowatt hours a, a month. So. Again, you know, how much you want to spend. <laughs> That's a starting point. Uh, you can get smaller ones, like I said, clear down to tent size, but you pay more per watt of output on the smaller systems. You get the 10 kW systems and, and bigger, you're starting to get better performance out of your dollar. And finally here, we talk about wind energy uh, being environmentally friendly and neighbor friendly. I think it's important to to identify you know, the differences that way. We want to be friendly to our environment, and you know, that's a lot of the reason why we do it, but it, it has to work with our neighbors too. You know, obviously, there's places you wouldn't want to put something up like that uh, next, next, next to a historical landmark or something like that maybe, although we've had some of those that actually request that because they want that renewable energy to, to look like they're green and, and to be supporting themselves that way. If it's done properly, it can actually be a money saver. You can trade the money you're paying for the utility and put it into the pay the bank, and then when you're done paying the bank, you're paying yourself. If it's done properly, that's the way the system should work, so that you're not ha increasing your cost per month. And that's the end of it. Those are neighborhood with mature trees. How far are those little trees will have to be? Uh, mature trees depends on the variety. Uh, some of those are 60 feet. Some of them are 80 feet. Uh, you should be in the neighborhood of, you know, 80 foot for a tower anyway. If you're 60 foot trees, uh, it depends on how close they are. That's at least, yeah, it gives you 20 feet above. It's better if you're a little higher than that. Yeah. Yes. Um, would you quickly compare the Birdie um, turbine to the ARE turbine? say the, the maximum, the Bergie uh, 10 kilowatt versus, I don't know what the max is on the ARE. The ARE, ARE has a 10 kilowatt one also. Okay, so they're, they're both, they both have the same rating. The difference is the Bergie reaches its rated output at 10 kilowatts at about 28 miles an hour, where the ARE reaches, reaches that same rating at about 20 miles an hour. Well, and so for your... So for your output difference, you're getting about 20% more for the ARE per month. And that's how it, the ARE at 12 mile an hour winds uh, produces about uh, 1850 to 1900 kilowatt hours a month. 1850 to, to 1900 kilowatt hours a month at 12 mile an hour winds. If you jump that to 14 mile an hour winds, you say you get it taller and get up into the 14 mile an hour.